know you. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. Jaywalking punk anarchist. <laughs> Hello, this is the Radical Reviewer taking a look at The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism by Naomi Klein, Picador Press, 2007. The key idea of this text is to illuminate, define, and critique the concepts shock doctrine and disaster capitalism. These refer to the practice of multinational corporations entering into disaster situations and selling aid and reconstruction. The disaster can be natural, like a hurricane or a tsunami, or the disaster can be man-made, like a war, a terrorist attack, or a debt crisis, and the disaster can even be caused by the reconstructionists themselves, as in the Iraq invasion. Whatever the disaster is, it causes a shock, which causes the population to become desperate and complacent. When this has occurred, loans, mass privatization, debt, mass austerity, and corporate takeover are advanced under the guise of aid and reconstruction. Or as Klein states in an offhand brief summary of the text, I'm writing a book about shock. About how countries are shocked by war, terror attacks, coup d'etats, and natural disasters, and then how they are shocked again by corporations and politicians who exploit the fear and disorientation of the first shock to push through economic shock therapy, and then how people who dare to resist these shock politics are, if necessary, shocked for a third time by police, soldiers, and prison interrogations. Let's take a look at the text in depth. Part 1. Two Dr. Shocks, Research and Development. This section introduces the shock metaphor and details the CIA's secret use of torture and shock therapy to erase the mind of the individual and make them a blank slate, and compares this to the CIA's coup and dirty war period in Latin America and the Middle East, where they attempted to turn entire countries into blank slates. Klein starts by explaining in great detail the CIA's shock therapy experiments, such as MKUltra, in where, with human test subjects, the CIA conducted experiments with LSD, PCP, insulin to induce long bouts of sleep, isolation, curare-induced paralysis, and electroshock, an attempt to clean the slate and remake the person from scratch, to erase their brain, essentially mind control. Klein's argument is that this is what disaster capitalism attempts to do to entire countries with the shock doctrine. To give some context on the ethos of disaster capitalism, Klein explains neoliberal theory, and more specifically Milton Friedman and the Chicago School. Klein explains the logic of their ideology thusly. First, Governments must remove all rules and regulations standing in the way of accumulation of profits. Second, they should sell off any assets they own that corporations could be running at a profit. And third, they should dramatically cut back funding for social programs. To finish this section, Klein draws a historical trajectory. Socialist policies, improving the lives of working people in countries like Iran, Guatemala, Chile, Indonesia, etc., with nationalizing industries, public work projects, etc., is contrasted with the creation of the Chicago School neoliberalism ideology and the creation of the CIA and the first coups, dirty wars, juntas, etc. in Latin America and the Middle East and the first inklings of what will become the shock doctrine. Part 2. The first test, birth pangs. In this section, Klein dives into a detailed history of CIA-backed coups and overthrows explaining how the Chicago School ideology was forced into countries backed by torture, assassination, and murder of those who resisted. Klein gives accounts of this taking place in Chile, Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay. The brutality and detail of the torture is extremely heart-wrenching. Klein argues that the use of torture is primarily about crushing the spirit of democracy and rebellion in the population. She states, the vast majority of the victims of the Southern Cone's terror apparatus were not members of armed groups, but nonviolent activists working in factories, farms, shanty towns, and universities. Klein continues. Many prisoners reported that their torturers were far less interested in the information, which they usually already possessed, than in achieving the act of betrayal itself. The point of the exercise was getting the prisoner to do irreparable damage to that part of themselves that believed in helping others above all else, that part of themselves that made them an activist, replacing it with shame and humiliation. 
This is because the terror wasn't simply about reigning in rebellion. The reality is, the Chicago school types knew the actions they were taking were against the democratic wishes of the people in the country. A great song referring to this brutal torture and its true purpose is Freshwater Octopuses, Pigs Protecting Pigs, a song for activists, where a correlation is made between effective activism and the use of torture to pacify it. Klein argues that the coups not only cleaned up the resistance, they attempted to erase future resistance. She states, in Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay, the juntas staged mass ideological cleanup operations, burning books by Freud, Marx, and Neruda, closing hundreds of newspapers and magazines, occupying universities, banning strikes, and political meetings. Klein concludes, Torture is an indicator species of a regime that is engaged in a deeply anti-democratic project. There is no humane way to rule people against their will. There is no peaceful way to take away from millions of citizens what they need to live with dignity. That is to say, that the pervasiveness of death squads and torture is testament to the level of force and coercion and complete lack of public support for these neoliberal mass privatization and austerity programs. Part 3. Surviving Democracy Bombs Made of Laws this section is about replacing the coups and dictators' method of disaster capitalism with debt crisis, and the introduction of Reaganomics and Thatcher's TINA, and the use of the IMF and WTO and neoliberal debt crises to achieve privatization, austerity, and structural adjustment programs. Klein explains that in the 60s and 70s, the economy was in a slump, but people were active and mistrusted the government. The Chicago School ideology could not be put in place in the U.S. or in Europe. But then came Reagan and Thatcher. In the early 80s, authoritarian regimes started collapsing in Iran, Nicaragua, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, and the old methods of U.S.-backed dictators seemed to be falling away. Yet Klein states, It was in 1982 that Milton Friedman wrote the highly influential passage that best summarizes the shock doctrine. Only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When the crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes politically inevitable. That is to say, only in the disorientation and confusion of a crisis can you install mass change, and so, neoliberalism needs crisis to make their politically impossible ideas become politically inevitable. Then, Thatcher entered into the Falkland War, which, although a pointless war, it doubled her approval ratings. Before the war, Thatcher had lost a battle with a strong coal miners union, but after the war, as Klein states, the coal miners went on strike in 1984, Thatcher cast the standoff as a continuation of the war with Argentina, calling for similar brutal resolve. This was followed up with mass police repression, counter-surveillance, wiretapping, etc. And Thatcher won, and 966 employees were fired and the union was devastated. And, a few months later, Reagan sent the same message to the air traffic controllers union, firing 11,400 of them. Enter Thatcherite and Tina and Reaganomics and mainstream adoption of neoliberalism and the first inklings of disaster capitalism in the West. Part of this change is the Volcker shock of the 1980s. As Klein states, Volcker shock, also known as the debt shock or the debt crisis, was like a giant taser gun fired from Washington sending the developing world into convulsions. This refers to Paul Volcker, who was chairman of the Federal Reserve, who crushed the strength of American working people with soaring inflation. And an added bonus for the neoliberals, Soaring interest rates meant higher interest payments on foreign debts, creating an international debt spiral. Now, it didn't matter that U.S.-backed dictators were being overthrown. Propping up corrupt, tyrannical military coups and dictators was no longer needed when international debts could get you structural adjustments and neoliberalist policies adopted in democratic countries. As Klein states, the principle was simple. Countries in crisis desperately needed emergency aid to stabilize their currencies. When privatization and free trade policies are packaged together with a financial bailout, 
Countries have little choice but to accept the whole package. Perhaps you've seen just this clamp down in your personal life. If you were debt free and living comfortably, you probably wouldn't slave away at two or three jobs. So enter getting a mortgage. Let's get you in debt. If you don't want a mortgage, well, how about student loans? And if that doesn't work, what about inflation and cutting your hours? And so one person working a job to support a family over the last few decades has become one person working a primary job and often working a second job or a ride sharing job or some other part time job on the side just to make ends meet. Part four, lost in transition. While we wept, while we trembled, while we danced. This section is about how South Africa was able to overthrow apartheid and win democracy, but that the economic chains remained in the form of GATT, WTO, and shock therapy. And the case was similar for Russia and Thailand, where the US Treasury and IMF let debt crises and unemployment wreak havoc on the countries, then multinationals came in and bought up everything for a pittance. As demonstrated in section three, Debt, rather than dictatorship, had become the new way to control other countries. As Klein argues, Suddenly, it seemed that the whole world was living in the same kind of fast-forward existence as the Poles, referring to the fall of the Berlin Wall. The Soviet Union was on the verge of breaking apart, apartheid in South Africa seemed on its last legs, authoritarian regimes continued to crumble in Latin America, Eastern Europe, and Asia, and long wars were coming to an end from Nambia to Lebanon. Everywhere, old regimes were collapsing, and new ones rising in their place had yet to take shape. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, as Michael Parenti, Noam Chomsky, and many others have argued, there was no middle ground for countries anymore. Where once a country could do something for its people, with the Soviets afraid the country will turn to America, and the Americans afraid the country will turn communist, there was a chance for some autonomy. But that's gone. Neoliberalism has become the only option. Klein states, when the Cold War was in full swing and the Soviet Union was intact, the people of the world could choose, at least theoretically, which ideology they wanted to consume. There were the two poles, and there was much in between. That meant capitalism had to win customers. It needed to offer incentives. It needed a good product. Keynesianism was always an expression of that need for capitalism to compete. And yet, this was no longer the case. I feel like Iraq is a great example for this section, but it is strangely not used. I like Iraq as an example because right before the collapse of the Soviet Union, Iraq was an ally receiving aid and weapons from the US. And right after the fall, bam, desert storm, US invasion of Iraq. Perhaps because Iraq is discussed so much later in the text, it made more sense to discuss other countries here. Looking at this debt crisis manipulation by the IMF, Klein refers to Davison Boudou, Klein states, he exhaustively documented how, as a fund employee in the mid-80s, he was involved in elaborate statistical malpractice to exaggerate the numbers in the IMF reports on oil-rich Trinidad and Tobago in order to make the country look far less stable than it actually was. John Perkins performed similar work for the IMF and explained in his book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, as well as the above lecture, how he was used by the IMF to falsify statistical analysis for loans and infrastructure projects contracted to U.S. multinationals, making the U.S. companies rich and making a few people in the host country rich, but ultimately causing widespread debt, theft of resources, and poverty for the country as a whole. Klein ends this section explaining how CIA torture manuals claim you can take torture too far and it will embolden the victim. It causes a backlash rather than complacency. And this was the case in Indonesia, where CIA installed Saharta was thrown out in political upheaval. And Klein concludes, in retrospect, it is striking that capitalism's monopoly period, when it no longer had to deal with competing ideas or counterpowers, was extremely brief. Only eight years, from the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 to the collapse of the WTO talks in 1999. Part 5. Shocking Times. The Rise of the Disaster Capitalism Complex. This section explains the rise of disaster capitalism and the implementation of a continuous war economy. How, ideally, a government shouldn't want war, and yet, as Bush, Cheney, and Rumsfeld led a privatization campaign to outsource the military, intelligence gathering, interrogations, security, etc., etc., major corporations and security firms 
looking for lucrative contracts wanted continuous war. This leads to blurring the line between corporate and state, as any country's restrictions on corporate profit or nationalizing resources are seen as tyrannical and even a tax on the U.S. And, as with Reagan, disaster capitalism comes home. Klein states, The White House used the omnipresent sense of peril in the aftermath of 9-11 to dramatically increase the policing, surveillance, detention, and war-waging powers of the executive branch. And, of course, new, and in some cases legally mandated technology created, in disaster capitalism, a revolving door between the military-industrial complex and homeland security and the technology of the private sector. As people in government positions make this or that technology mandatory by law or hand huge contracts to tech companies, then leave the government to go sell that technology back to the government. Klein talks about Donald Rumsfeld cutting up the U.S. military in a similar way that corporations downsize. For example, replacing full troops with reserves and National Guardsmen and contractors from Blackwater and Halliburton. Klein states, U.S. bases sprang up as many Halliburton cities, neat, gated suburbs, built and run entirely by the company. Klein concludes, In just five years at Halliburton, Cheney almost doubled the amount of money the company extracted from the U.S. Treasury. In fact, even the CIA's functions were becoming outsourced as Donald Rumsfeld created the Counterintelligence Field Activity, FICA, whose budget is 70% private contractors. Klein states that the crisis theory was going postmodern, meaning the Chicago School theories of shock therapy were being applied to the apparatus of shock therapy itself, that is, privatizing the military, intelligence, first responders, etc., etc. Klein concludes, As proto-disaster capitalists, the architects of the war on terror are part of a different breed of corporate politicians from their predecessors, one from whom wars and other disasters were indeed ends in themselves. Klein concludes, What is unquestionably good for the bottom line of these companies is cataclysm, wars, epidemics, natural disasters, and resource shortages. Part 6. Iraq. Full Circle. Overshock. This section compares methods of torture and the shock doctrine metaphor to the Iraq invasion. Sensory deprivation is bombing TV, radio, and phone infrastructure. Klein states, Many Iraqis say that the shredding of their phone system was the most psychologically wretching part of the air attack. Thoughtless gifts are opening Iraq's market for cheap imports. The shock of torture is the expensive bombing. Another torture is to remove all aspects of the individual's self, to remove their clothes and their name and anything that would bring them a sense of self. And Klein states, Iraqi went through this unmaking process collectively, as they watched their most important institutions desecrated, their history loaded onto trucks and disappeared. The bombings badly injured Iraq, but it was the looting, unchecked by the occupying troops, that did the most to erase the heart of the country that was. Klein gives a specific example of the disaster capitalism revolving door between government and the private sector, stating, New bridge strategies, started by Joe Alba, Bush's ex-head of FEMA, it promised to use its top-level political connections to help U.S. multinationals land a piece of the action in Iraq. Getting the rights to distribute Procter & Gamble products would be a gold mine, one of the company's partners enthused. One well-stocked 7-Eleven could knock out 30 Iraqi stores. A Walmart could take over the country. Klein argues that, before the invasion, Iraq's economy had been anchored by its national oil company and by 200 state-owned companies, which produced the staples of the Iraqi diet and the raw materials of its industry, everything from cement to paper and cooking oil. A month after he arrived for his new job, Paul Bremer, the U.S.-installed leader of Iraq's future, announced that the 200 firms were going to be privatized immediately. Bremer shut down democratic elections and instituted a hand-picked governing council. Mass protests and revolt followed, and mass arrests and torture followed that. And a destruction-reconstruction loop was formed as reconstruction contractors flee the chaos with the money and security contractors come in to quell the chaos.
And on top of this, only 15,000 Iraqis were hired to work for the U.S. funded reconstruction during Bremer's tenure, a staggeringly low figure. Klein goes into great detail on the infamous laws of Bremer, which were dictatorially enforced, and even after Bremer had left, that decree was still the law of the land, despite Iraq's so-called democracy. These laws included a lower corporate tax rate, allowing foreign companies to own 100% of Iraq's assets, firing almost 500,000 state workers, including soldiers, doctors, teachers, and engineers, many of whom, soldiers in particular, immediately joined the resistance, and many wealthy Iraqis who lost their assets to foreign investors also began funding the resistance. And again, we see privatization and contracts going to subcontracts and then further subcontractors ad infinitum, and no work is done. Klein states, the Democratic Senator Byron Dorgan described this web using an air conditioning contract in Baghdad as an example. The contract goes to a subcontractor, which goes to another subcontractor, and a fourth level subcontractor. And the payment for the air conditioning turns out to be payments to four subcontractors, and the fourth of which puts a fan in a room. And Klein concludes, This mismanagement continued for three and a half years, until all the major U.S. reconstruction contractors pull out of Iraq, their billions spent, and the bulk of the work still undone. With unemployed police, military, and civilians joining the resistance to fight against the takeover of their country, the response is, of course, detention and torture, and so the shocks continue. Klein states, An estimated 300 Iraqi academics have been assassinated by death squads since the U.S. invasion, including several college deans. Thousands more have fled. Klein continues, November 2005, 173 Iraqis were discovered in an interior ministry dungeon. Some tortured so badly that their skin was falling off, others with drill marks in their skulls and teeth, and toenails removed. Klein explains that contract workers, that is, private security, private military like Blackwater, has gone from one for every 100 U.S. soldiers, as during the Gulf War in 1991, to today, where it is one private security contractor for every U.S. soldier. Preparing for future disaster capitalist ventures, Klein states, A year and a half into the Iraqi occupation, the U.S. Department launched a new branch, the Office of Reconstruction and Stabilization. On any given day, it is paying private contractors to draw up detailed plans to reconstruct 25 different countries that may, for one reason or another, find themselves the target of U.S.-sponsored destruction, from Venezuela to Iran. Corporations and consultants are lined up on pre-signed contracts. So keep this in mind when some politician or pundit says that X country is out of control, X country supports terrorism, X leader is a tyrant, etc., etc., because there are several and often worse examples which the U.S. might even support and give aid to, and yet they have singled out this specific example for deserving military aggression. And why? Well, perhaps it might have something to do with this desire for neoliberal contracts, privatization, and austerity in that country. Part 7. The Movable Green Zone, Buffer Zones, and Blast Walls. This section is about the tsunami that hit Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Thailand, and Maldives, as aid came in the form of contracts to move poor people off their fishing land and put luxury hotels in their place. Poverty, misuse of aid, militarization of refugee zones led to chaos and even civil war in Sri Lanka. And Klein argues, The next phase of the disaster capitalism complex is all too clear. With emergencies on the rise, government no longer able to foot the bill, and citizens stranded by their can't-do state, the parallel corporate state will rent back its disaster infrastructure to whoever can afford it, and whatever price the market will bear. Referring to the overall impact of the tsunami reconstruction in Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Thailand, etc., Klein states, A year after the tsunami, a respected NGO, Action Aid, which monitors foreign aid spending, published the results of an extensive survey of 50,000 tsunami survivors in five countries. The same patterns repeated everywhere. 
Residents were barred from rebuilding, but hotels were showered with incentives. Temporary camps were miserable, militarized holding pens, and almost no permanent reconstruction had been done. Entire ways of life were being extinguished. It concluded that the setbacks could not be chalked up to the usual villains of poor communication, underfunding, or corruption. The problems were structural and deliberate. In referring to the devastation of Hurricane Katrina, where subcontracting, like in Iraq, meant the work was never done, and green and red zones were formed so that nice areas were rebuilt while others were left to rot. Klein states, At first, I thought the green zone phenomenon was unique to the war in Iraq. Now, after years spent in other disaster zones, I realized that the green zone emerges everywhere that the disaster capitalism complex descends, with the same stark partitions between the included and the excluded, the protected and the damned. Klein then gives an exhausted list of the work left unfinished after Hurricane Katrina, and where the same subcontractor to subcontractor loop we'd seen already let all the money go into overhead and no work got done. Klein argues, Given the boiling temperatures, both climatic and political, future disasters need not be cooked up in dark conspiracies. All indicators are that simply staying the current course, they will keep coming with even more ferocious intensity. Conclusion In the conclusion, Klein brings up multiple countries where shock therapy has had a reactionary response, sometimes a racist or sexist response. And yet, Klein also gives positive examples of community reconstruction where new local leaders didn't fall for the IMF loan story and communities simply built themselves up rather than falling for shock therapy and instead were making themselves shock resistant. Klein states, of all the differences, the most striking is the acute awareness of the need for protection from the shocks of the past, the coups, the foreign shock therapists, the U.S. trained torturers, as well as the debt shocks and currency collapses of the 80s and 90s. Latin America's mass movement, which have powered the wave of election victories for left-wing candidates, are learning how to build shock absorbers into their organizing models. And for the documentary style, things are starting to get better type ending, Klein explains that when a tsunami hit Thailand in 2004, hundreds of villagers walked past the armed guards blocking off the land, and people began marking off and even rebuilding on the land where their homes had been. Klein concludes, Radical, only in their intense practicality, rooted in the communities where they lived, these men and women see themselves as mere repair people, taking what's there and fixing it, reinforcing it, making it better and more equal. Most of all, they are building in resilience for when the next shock hits. Conclusion For people interested in geopolitical economic trends of late capitalism, this book is a must read. Since its inception, capitalism was always looking for new pockets of profit to exploit. At each step, it seems, economists are saying there is nowhere else for capitalism to go. Labor has been fully exploited. Third world countries have been fully exploited. Barriers in time and space have been obliterated. Yet, as we have seen in this text, capitalism has found a lower, more despicable low to sink to. Disaster capitalism and shock doctrine profiting off of aid and reconstruction required after a disaster, and then using the shock of the disaster to ram through privatization, austerity, and debt. Although this text is a decade old as of this review, I always look to its lesson when I hear some politician or pundit explaining that we must do something in regards to a disaster situation. I am now on the lookout for the creeping abuse of the shock doctrine and disaster capitalism trying to exploit those suffering disaster. If you're interested in radical theory, looking for a book recommendation, or whatever, you can get your radical book reviews here with the Radical Reviewer. Thanks for watching.